Montana Ag Live is made possible by the Montana Department of Agriculture, the MSU Extension Service, the MSU Ag Experiment Stations of the College of Agriculture, the Montana Wheat and Barley Committee, Cashman Nursery and Landscaping, the Northern Pulse Growers Association, and the Gallatin Gardeners Club. Good evening and welcome to Montana Ag Live, brought to you from the PBS studio here at beautiful Montana State University. So we finally have a couple of days of sunshine, so I think you all are like me and are ready to get outside and, and get to work, um, not only in our gardens but on our farms and, and occasionally we come across a few pests and we'll be able to talk a little bit about that today um, of the more animal type of pests. So, um, I'll take this opportunity to introduce our, our panel. I'm very excited. On the end, we have Uta McKelvey, who is our new extension specialist for seed potatoes and sugar beets and also some other crops. But I am very excited to have somebody on board and looking forward to working with Uta. We have Stephen Van Tassel from uh, Montana Department of Agriculture. He's an invasive pest specialist. So any questions that you might have about any rodents, other animals that are bothering your crops, gardens, um, he's the person to ask. Um, Jane Mangold is a rangeland weed specialist here at MSU and she's got um, one little show and tell for us today. So we'll look forward to seeing what she's got for us. Um, David Baumbauer on my immediate left uh, is the, uh, he's the superintendent of both the Hort Farm and the Plant Growth Center and a horticulturalist. So he's really the guy at the university that keeps all of the uh, agronomist, plant pathologists and everybody going, making sure um, that everybody can, can support and do their research. So our, uh, answering the phones tonight, we have Nikki and John Vraderberg. So this is a call-in show, so everybody please come to us with lots of questions. So um, Stephen, if you'd like to just take a little bit um, of time right now and tell us about what you do as your job as a pest specialist. Sure, so I help people resolve conflicts with vertebrate animals, that's animals with a spine. So things like ground squirrels, pocket gophers, voles, prairie dogs, uh, unprotected birds, which would be pigeons, house sparrows, starlings, and I even help with other animals as well. So great, thank you. Well, we always have a lot of questions and a lot of times we have to say, we're gonna wait until we've got somebody to answer those questions. So um, I'm sure there'll be a lot coming in. Um, first, um, David, this is a question from Hamilton and I don't know if this is one that I've ever seen before. Um, how do you grow watercress in a home garden? So watercress is a, uh, not a very common leafy green that's used um, as you know, the fresh leaves, but it, uh, seed packs are available at, um, if not at your local garden center, you can find them online at some specialty garden um, seed producers. And then uh, it takes a lot of light, it takes a lot of moisture and a kind of moderate fertility. And so if you have, uh, oh, if you want to grow it in a container, you could use like a high peat media, or if you're going to have a garden, maybe you can amend it so that you have, you know, a fairly high water holding capacity part of your, your garden. So really fast crop, I want to say three, four weeks. So. Okay. David, is it a cool weather crop? Like, would you want to start it early in the this, this summer? I would think so, yes. I think once it gets into July, it's probably not going to do all that well. So. Okay. Well. We've certainly got cool wet weather now, so maybe this is a good year for watercress. Could water be a crest. watercress year. There we go. <laughs> Everybody's planting watercress. Yes. <laughs> All right, Jane, from Lake County. Uh, this person has western salsify in their alfalfa and grass hay pasture. Do you have any recommendations for getting rid of salsify? Yeah, actually, we did some research on western salsify. It's been 10, 12 years ago. It was a real problem in CRP lands in uh, north central Montana. So we did some work. There had been very little work done on western salsify prior to that. And one of the things we learned was that the timing of, well, we tried mowing and we tried some different herbicide applications. Um, and uh, that's 
Hori lists them on the screen right now, just FYI. Uh, Western salsify is a yellow flower that gets the big dandelion puff. Right. Um, so uh, there's very little not information about it, but we did find that the timing of a herbicide application is very important. You want to make sure you're treating it when it's still in that rosette stage, which at the rosette stage, it kind of looks like a grass. It's got real uh, thin linear leaves that look a lot like grass. However, if you break a leaf, you will see uh, wet, uh, white sap coming out of the leaves. But anyway, uh, one of the things we learned in addition to the timing was that just a 2,4-D and dicamba combination application um, at that rosette stage was very effective. If it had started to flower, we've got virtually no control with the same herbicides. So um, timing is really critical. Uh, you know, other parts of the state are probably a little bit ahead of where Bozeman is right now, uh, uh, weather-wise and plant growth-wise. I think that year we were doing the, the research, we were treating it in mid to late May was a good timing. Okay. So that's spot treatment, right? You don't want 2,4-D on your alfalfa. You're, you're correct, yeah. Okay. Well, yeah, it, I guess it depends on that situation, if it's how overrun the pasture is okay. with western salsify. Uh, I have seen western salsify get very dense, and, and you're to but you're totally right, David. If it's um, that treatment, the 2,4-D and dicamba would also injure alfalfa. But so that would be fine for grass hay. For grass hay, it okay. would be fine, yeah. Okay, great, thank you. So, Stephen, we're going to take care of a little bit of business. I guess a few weeks ago, there was a call that came in from north of Columbus. And so Jack took this call, but there was nobody on the, on the um, panel at the time. Um, they have way too many rattlesnakes on their property. They'd like to know how they can get rid of them or severely reduce their numbers. So before you start, evidently Jack did a little homework, and there is a business out of Paradise Valley called Take My Snakes. So if you're interested in actually working with somebody on that, um, there is a, an entity out there that'll work on it, but could you just comment a little bit on dealing with rattlesnakes? Sure, so the one thing you wanna do is always think in terms of habitat. So anything you can do to make your, your yard area uh, as clean and green as possible, because snakes are gonna want structure to hide in because they're an ambush predator. So the next thing you'd want to do is make sure you teach your family not to put their hands and feet in areas where they can't see. Now that may be hard, easier said than done, but that type of training, just like you teach your children to look both ways before you cross the street, you need to be sort of snake savvy. And sometimes just wearing jeans, loose fitting jeans can give you an incredible amount of protection from a bite to your leg. Not perfect protection, but substantive. And then the next thing would be to look for the hibernaculum and that's where the quote unquote nest is. And if you can find that and then you would simply attack the, you know, capture them and kill them. But you need to be careful. Most bites occur because people are going after the snake. In fact, uh, most, most bites occur uh, when people are going after the snake rather than staying away from it. So this is where a little bit of experience and they're faster than people realize. And I have a publication on it, so definitely download it from Montana Department of Ag website. It'll give you a lot more detail in what I've just given today. How about those of us with bird dogs? <laughs> yeah, so the issue with bird dogs, and that can be tough, but typically, you're starting to get into the colder seasons. So the, 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 the warmer days is what you'd wanna be paying more attention to. Once you're starting to get down below that 50 degree level, you know, the, the snakes are not gonna be that mobile or, in, or they're gonna to have to come out during the time when it's the heat hottest part of the day. And so they're gonna be moving toward their hibernaculum. It depends how early or late you are in your hunting season. But you know, even the research has shown that when dogs get bit, uh, if they are get bit, that many of them just recover even without any antivenom. The, some of the research shows that it didn't seem to matter that, that whether the antivenom was given to them or not. And also, many times a snake bites and it's, it's a dry bite. So you don't always assume if there's a bite that there's automatically venom given. It's they not always the case. Yeah, the, they can control that because they're, gonna, they're not gonna be able to eat a dog. So the venom is really for the capture of, of, of prey. It's, and then secondarily for defense. So they're not always envenomating when they bite. 
So there's a possibility, plus the advantage with dogs is when they're injured, they tend to come to their owner, where cats tend to go away and hide by themselves. And so cats are a little bit tougher. So, but there's no perfect way to, to resolve some of that. Just knowing that you're in, if you're in snake country, just be aware that there could be a, there could be a bite, but try to go out on a colder day and you're gonna have, you're gonna reduce that risk. Okay. Excellent, thank you. Thank you. So, Uta, um, this is from Bozeman, and I think everybody is seeing the same thing. Their lawn is finally emerging from beneath the snow, but it looks awful. <laughs> what can they do to revive it? Yeah, um, that's true. True, they don't look that pretty, right? Uh, well, you know, this, uh, the the lawn has been dormant for several months now, and so this is gonna take a couple of weeks for it to kind of spring into action, start greening up. So for now, I think. A lot of the, the grass blades uh, from the previous year are dead, maybe due to snow mold or just due to time. And so raking the uh, dead grass material away, maybe some leaves that drop uh, in the fall uh, as well would be a good start. That will probably help the lawn green up. And then um, something to think about this time of year would be uh, core aeration, um, using a, a tool to kind of poke holes in the lawn to help aerate that the roots or get air to the roots that will help the lawn grow and um, also if you have a lawn that has a lot of fetch which is like that um, thick like biomass accumulating you know kind of break that up a little bit and help water get to the roots those would be some steps to take here in the spring do you have anything to add David no my art's terrible because I didn't get all the leaves raked before <laughs> Well, we've uh, had continuous snow since the third week yeah, of October. October. Mm -hmm. So, yeah. Yeah, mine yeah. is not a pretty sight either. So but the cat I actually loves it. was raking around <laughs> snow piles yesterday oh. just to try to like. Because <laughs> we want to do something, right? Yeah. Well, you look at all. I mean, I got. There's mycelium. That's what I'm seeing, right? Yeah. The white yeah. webbing yeah. all over it's the everywhere. place. So I was like, well, let's. Break it will up. go away yeah. naturally over time, but raking could, you know, speed up the process a little bit, essentially. Yes. So do you want to guys want to talk a little bit more about snow molds on Basically, lawns? unless it's super severe, probably no reason for any type of treatment. Mm -hmm. And then one way to um, probably uh, in the future, so this fall, um, do that fall fertilization around Labor Day, run one pound of nitrogen per thousand square foot of lawn. And then make sure your grass is cut between like two and three inches, not too short, not too long. Mm -hmm. And then so your grass will be as, about as healthy as it can be before it goes in, and that will be your best defense against, you know, damaging snow mold. Yeah, I but, agree. So one thing that I've been finding the last few years, we go into that rule of having the two or three inch lawn, but then when do you quit? Yeah, cutting your exactly. lawn and then your lawn does end up being a little yeah. tall and rangy going in and you get a little bit that's what happened to me I didn't see it coming and yet there was way too long of grass blades covered under snow and now it looks terrible right yeah. what do you think about fertilizing lawn when would be like na Next, when is the best the time for a spring yeah treatment? so I use the Dr. Bob Goff for those of us that are old timers and so the holidays and it's mm -hmm. uh, mm -hmm. uh, Memorial Day 4th of July and Labor Day mm -hmm. and for most lawns, that one pound of actual nitrogen per thousand square feet is a good kind of starting spot. Mm -hmm. You potentially could get it on earlier, but the problem with getting it on earlier, then it rains, and then you can't get out and mow it, and so then you have a hay field for a mm -hmm. front yard. So that's why Memorial Day was kind of his yeah. choice for that. Yeah. So yeah, divide it up, three applications. Mm -hmm. I'm not very good about the midsummer one because I don't irrigate very much. And right. so if it's already dry and it's like, well, I'm not going to yeah. put fertilizer. We down. usually get one a year, either the Memorial Day or the Labor Day. Day. So. <laughs> yeah. Another thing about the core aeration, if you have a pretty heavy soil, like once you core aerate your, your lawn, you could like sprinkle a little bit of compost soil to mm -hmm. fill up those holes. You know, it's also a way to add some uh, nutrients and, you know, kind of help with that dense texture. Uta, can you do that too early? Like if the soil is too moist or is that not an issue? Actually, the uh, core aeration is recommended when the soil is a little bit more moist than when it's dry. Yeah. yeah. And then so there are these um, just like thin spikes. They don't really do a whole lot. You want to get the heavy machinery out there that actually pulls out pulls the soil core. cores. Yeah. yeah. Looks like the geese had a convention. Yeah. 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 Exactly. <laughs> 
So, so Jane, a question from Hardin. Um, this person says that they know Dyer's Woad is a state noxious, state listed noxious weed. Are there any places that they can collect Dyer's Woad for textile dye? Oh, I've never yeah. heard of that. Before. Yeah, that's actually one of the reasons Dyer's Woad was brought to North America. It's it's used at, to get an indigo dye out of different parts of the plant. Um, yeah, Dyer's Woad is an interesting species. It's uh, it is present in Montana, and it has been for 30, 40 years, but it's one of the species where the state has been very aggressive in um, managing it, and actually we're, we're very close to eradicating it. Like, we've gone from thousands of plants being found to just tens of plants being found, um, uh, and it's in various places across the state. But, yeah, there's, um, I don't think there's enough Dyer's woad present in the state anymore that you could collect it for textile dye. <clears throat> and actually, um, given all the work that's gone into trying to control it, uh, we don't want to encourage people to do that because we have had some situations over the years where we found it in yards where people were um, cultivating it for, for. dye. Yeah. So, great. Well, so, while we have been visiting, um, the screen has been lighting up with questions <laughs> for Stephen. Okay. A lot of questions about voles. Um, voles. Voles yeah. from Bozeman, um, from Anaconda, let's see, um, Jefferson County. I mean, a lot of questions coming in about voles okay. and pocket gophers. And I see you've got some some show and tells got today. A few, got a few traps. Okay, so when we're dealing with voles, so understand there's a publication on voles that I've written. It's available from the Montana Department of Ag website. So we're going to start with that, of course. Uh, now, in term, unfortunately, the time to control voles, you kind of missed it. That should have been done last fall. Nevertheless, uh, can you continue to work on voles? The answer is yes, but you're not going to get a whole lot of benefit from it other than maybe the satisfaction of killing a few of them, and there is value in that emotional response. <laughs> <laughs> Nevertheless, um, so you want to look at it. You have to ask yourself, do you want to use a toxicant or do you want to use traps? So if you're using a toxicant, a lot of your baits for mice and rats will have voles on the label. They're typically restricted to bait stations within 100 feet of your structure. Don't put them in your garden. We don't want rodenticides in your garden. Uh, but you can use them to control voles out to 100 feet from a structure. And that could be your house. It could be a permanent shed. Again, 100 feet. Just read the label. Read it before you purchase it. And those are some options. If you're concerned about secondary poisoning, which you should be, you want to try to use the first generation anticoagulants. And that's warfarin, chlorofacinone, or difacinone. Those have a lower toxicity rate. Uh, so that's, they're safer in terms of secondary poisoning issues. Not safe, safer. Uh, and then, of course, if you want traps, just putting mouse traps like this in the trails, you don't even need bait. The voles will just simply crawl it. So if the trail's coming this way, the vole just walks through, touches it, bang, and it gets caught. It's really that simple. You're like, well, won't they be avoiding? No, they'll just simply climb over each other. So stack them up on the trail, they'll, and you'll just catch them without any bait whatsoever. And of course, if you're using a trap like this, this is a rat-sized trap. Just use the mouse size. You want the expanded trigger. Same thing. You want the trigger in the trail for the vole and just stack them up along the trail. And if you're worried about pets or something, just put a cover over them. Just make sure it's not going to interfere with the striker bar. Traps are like money. More is better. <laughs> All right. So, so yeah, my husband set a pretty extensive trap line last fall, and he put a five-gallon bucket over the top. Sure. Mm -hmm. So that bolt to protect against Pets, does it sure. increase the efficacy at all? Or? Actually, it would, believe it or not. So voles need cover because everything wants to eat a vole. So I typically tell people to use like a piece of sheet of plywood, prop it up with a stone, and then you could put traps underneath it. You can even bait them. But if you have a trail, there's no need to bait it. Just simply place the trap perpendicular so the vole has to cross over the, treadle, the, the trigger. But if you don't, if you have holes, sometimes voles are just 
creating little holes in your turf. Then you would want baited traps, and that would you'd want to cover that so you're not catching birds and other non-target animals. And just put a sheet of plywood over, put a rock on top, and they would love, they would be very attracted to that. Yeah, what I've noticed this year is areas of our lawn where we've never had vole damage, well, it's not really that big of a damage issue, but um, I think with the snow cover, we've mm -hmm. just got an incredible number of Yeah, holes. I've even had some in my own yard, but I, but it, I, for me, it was just a photo opportunity. So I, I'm not a big lawn person myself. So, but nevertheless, you can, the time to control voles is actually in the fall. Mm -hmm. So you knock the population down before the winter hits, and then the winter does more dam that does more damage to the population. So that by the springtime, you're not getting all those trails underneath. But can you control now? Sure, if it you know. What about strawberry bubble gum as bait? Oh gosh, yeah. So did you wish you had a dollar for every time here, someone I asked just, you yeah. about strawberry here's the, bubble gum? Here's the thing: if I'm always fascinated by these anecdotal stories, bubble gum. No, 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 not from, just bubble gum. Yeah, strawberry. Super, yeah. <laughs> so the question is: Do you chew it first? <laughs> Do you need well, to you unwrap just, it? Well, you have to unwrap it. You have it to unwrap if it. to okay. soften it up. Yeah. I just remember the accountant kicked back my invoice for 40 packs of strawberry bubble gum. <laughs> yeah. Like, what no, are you doing? It's just, like, yeah, really, it's, it's a legit thing. So, <laughs> no, it's just the idea of what, it's supposed to bind them up inside and prevent them from digesting it or something. Yeah, no, it's just, here's the thing. If, if it seems too weird, it's not going to work. If it's too easy, it's not going to work. If you don't want to do it, it'll likely work. <laughs> um, because I find that usually when I give advice, people don't want to do it. And that's, it's sort of like losing weight, right? We all want the pill. I want the pill. I want the pill to work. I know it's not going to work, but I want it to work. And I, because I know I don't want to do what I'm supposed to do to lose weight, right? It's the same way with wildlife. There's no magic here, folks. There's just things that work and don't work. Okay. <laughs> Thank you. And... I hope you covered about 10 questions that we had that came in. I hope so, on yeah. Bowls because, yeah. So yeah, it did. is sure. a hot topic at this time of year always, and I think especially this year. Yep. So, um, Uta, um, a question that came in from Guilford. Um, this grower has a spring wheat crop. Two years ago, it looked great until harvest. Then it started falling over right before harvest. It wasn't wheat stem sawfly. The plants didn't have a, a deep root system. Would the seed treatment help? with this type of a problem? Yeah, that's a good question. And it depends, you know, doing a diagnosis from the distance and then also, you know, two years after the fact is kind of tricky. Um, so there are several reasons what could have happened to that wheat that could have caused it to lodge. It could have been root rots. It could have been something else. I don't know if it were root rots then seed treatments certainly could help. I mean, generally, I would always say seed treatments are a good idea to apply to your crops. They typically help with the crop establishment, so things that can attack your, your seedlings at an early stage. They don't provide season-long protection, but a well-established crop is also going to be more resilient against other things that attack it throughout the season. Um, typically, we recommend using a fungicide treatment that has a broad spectrum activity, so it targets all sorts of different types of pathogens that can come and try and nibble on your uh, seedlings. But what exactly was the cause in, in that person's situation? Um, I would encourage them, I mean, hopefully it doesn't happen again, but if they see similar issues or have concerns this year around, maybe send a sample to the Scudder Diagnostic Lab and we can have a look of what might be going on and then um, talk about some more specific targeted management recommendations. Okay, great, thanks Uta. Yeah. So um, a question um, came in for Bozeman about potatoes, and this is actually a really interesting question. Will all the snow we got this year affect seed potatoes? And that's actually a really good, thoughtful question because a really deep snow cover can um, result in a situation where you get volunteer potatoes. So potatoes mm -hmm. that weren't harvested from the last or that, that remained in the field from last year's harvest, if you have a real deep snow cover and the ground doesn't freeze, mm -hmm. um, then you can get volunteers. And those volunteers yeah, yeah. can potentially harbor diseases that could affect a neighboring seed potato crop. So um, hopefully we did get enough frost in the ground um, that there mm. won't be a lot of volunteers, but um, it is more of a possibility when you have a very, mm -hmm. a very high snow cover year. Mm -hmm. So. 
So, Nina, good, good have question. you planted your potatoes yet? No. This year? Okay. <laughs> I literally have this much snow on my garden. I probably okay. have almost two feet left. Right. So, David, have you? You're you're here in town, which is probably a little less snow than the Nina. Hort Farm. I had to go out and check on my bees on Monday. I had to put snowshoes on because I oh. went out the day before and I post hold up to my knees. <laughs> it's better now, yeah. but. I was out yesterday, and there was still a foot of snow. Yeah, we still have a lot of snow. And it's not drifts. No, I mean, right. And, just... and honestly, you should not really, in most places in Montana, the middle of May is a great time to plant your potatoes. Like the first of May, maybe, but middle of May is really okay. potato planting time for, mm -hmm. for your home garden. So um, I think we need to, to jump over to Stephen because a, a really timely question um, I, has come in, and this is from Hot Springs, and they would like to know the latest about the wild hog invasion from Canada. Oh, okay. So feral hogs, we do have feral hogs north of the border in Alberta and Saskatchewan. So they, they've been getting monitored to see if they're going to cross the border. Uh, there have been some reports that there have been some sign of the, some of them crossing the border, but it looks like there's, there's no permanent population yet. We do not want feral hogs in Montana. They are going to be devastating to our environment. So if you happen to notice any sign of feral hogs, usually they'll, they'll root up the soil like it's been rototilled, or you see one, make sure you notify what Fish, Wildlife, and Parks, or the Montana Department of Ag, or your extension agent. We want to know where that's been located. If your trail camera picks something up, we want to get that information. We need to eradicate this species before it becomes established because of the disease and the environmental impacts of this particular pest. I know a lot of people love hunting them, but unfortunately, and I would love to be able to trap one and do some work with them, but nevertheless, we do not want them in Montana. They'd be devastating for our agriculture and economy. Yeah. and. One thing that I read that I thought was a little surprising um, just a little while ago, it said um, that, like, initially, the first ones that come in, not to shoot them because then... They'll disperse. They'll disperse. Yeah. yeah. So you, it's also illegal to shoot them. Uh -huh. So that's part... We don't want that hunting culture to come in. So Montana followed the best practices uh, of, like, the other states of Nebraska where they banned it before it became established. Unfortunately, some people like to drive them into states because of the hunting culture because I guess they're quite popular to be hunted. But, again, I just want to reiterate that the diseases they would have for livestock, the damage they would do to our nat native species mm -hmm. because they... They eat everything, mm -hmm. and they will go. Th and then, of course, whatever diseases would be involved as well. So they would be devastating for both our natural resources and then our agricultural resources. And so, if you see one, say see something, say something. We definitely want you to let us know if there's if there if you find them in Montana. Could I add just a little bit to mm -hmm. that? Uh, there is a, a campaign in the state, Squeal on Pigs, mm -hmm. oh, and. Mm -hmm. uh, if you, I'm guessing if you Google squeal on pigs, squeal Montana, on pigs. Yep. you will find lots of information about feral pigs, including the phone number to yes. call if you see damage that you think is mm -hmm. associated with feral pigs or you think you see mm -hmm. a feral pig. Um, and uh, you can also find that information on the Montana Invasive Species Council That's correct. You're right. website as well. Yep. So, Good yeah, additions. hopefully five years from now, we're not talking about how we control the feral pigs that oh, are already yeah. here. It's, so. I think it's going to be a long-standing problem for us because the situation in Canada is really a mess, and it's mm -hmm. we're going to constantly see pressure. I don't think that's going to go away for probably decades. Okay. Okay, question for David, and this is from Bozeman, Sweet Pea Capital of Montana. <laughs> <laughs> so what are the secret, secrets to growing great sweet peas? Mm -hmm. Well, I know there's always this... Uh, rush to get them in the ground really, really early. And, and just like with potatoes, mm -hmm. that doesn't need to happen. They can have a hard seed coat, so sometimes it's beneficial to soak them overnight. And oftentimes you'll see recommendations about some additional phosphorus because that builds good blooms. And so an easy way to do that um, is like bone meal. It's a really slowly soluble form of phosphorus. And so you could put a little bit of that, uh, mix it up in the bottom of the planting hole, and uh, there you go. And then an adequate trellis. So they have, uh, they can put their energy into uh, <clears throat> leaves and flowers and not so much on, uh, on, on having to, 
to climb things. So yeah, give them a good trellis. Okay. Do they now, like a lot of light? Yeah. So I've been trying to grow sweet peas in my little garden beds for years now, and as soon as they come up, something comes and munches them. Any advice? <laughs> <laughs> oh, you got the luck. I would think uh, uh, I'm, I'm a big fan of fences, mm -hmm. so build them out. Uh, I would think that probably rabbits would love your, uh, how high are the damage are you seeing? All the way up or just at the lower end? I mean, I just chopped the ceiling and that's yeah. the end of that. <laughs> okay, well, and then that would be probably, it could be rabbits or deer and fencing mm -hmm. would take care of both. Mm -hmm. I would go to half inch mesh and build it out so that they can't approach. Right. That way you're not using a pesticide or repellent or anything like mm -hmm. that. You're, that'll work. I mean, it'd be ugly looking to be sure, but it'll, you'll have plants. It could be your trellis, so you could make a May, yeah. cylinder and plant your peas on the inside and then they'll climb up. Yeah. And, yeah. Yeah. That'll give me something to do until I can actually plant them. Yeah, yeah. That's <laughs> right. Exactly. Now you can build fence. I'll do build my fence. best to make them look pretty, Stephen. Oh, there you go. Well, just, <laughs> some people, that's it's a big problem. We try to, they have problems with rabbits, and I'll tell them to build a fence, and you can see their their crest fall, and they yeah. don't want to look at the fence. I'm like, well, it's it's one of the few things that really work well. And mm -hmm. But again, if it works, we don't want to do it. So, Stephen, I, not with sweet peas, but I've had just, like green peas mm -hmm. in my garden before, and I think it, the house sparrows were eating mm -hmm. them off. Were have you, you ever seen that? I have not. So, um, but yeah, fencing would still be another indicator of preventing that as yeah, well. Yeah, I actually put some screen over the top just till they got a little bit bigger. Yeah, so if they're house sparrows, you can have nest box traps to help reduce that population. So uh, house sparrows are not protected, so we can give a permanent solution to that. <laughs> so great, we've got a phone number um, up on the screen right now. So if um, you have any information about feral pigs, please call that 888 number um, that you can see on the, on the television right now. Squeal so, on the pigs. Squeal on pigs. All right, so um, Jane, a question came in from Big Fork. Um, last fall they have applied Rejuvra and Plateau herbicides. When should they see results, and what should he look for so he knows if these treatments have worked? Yeah, so those two herbicides are used on annual grasses, probably cheatgrass in this case. Um, and they, they work below the soil surface, so they're a pre-emergent herbicide. Well, the Rejuvra is a pre-emergent herbicide. So what he should look for is... Bare, he'll probably going to have bare ground where his cheatgrass was in previous years. So because that's working below the surface of the soil on seeds that are germinating, you never see any emergence of the seedlings. So it's a little different herbicide than what we're used to using in like range and pasture where we, we spray uh, green tissue and then we see that injury. In this case, if it's worked correctly, he won't see any seedlings of cheatgrass this spring. So then how soon can I plant something else? <laughs> yeah, so uh, Rejuvra specifically, it's, uh, the plateau is a little different story, but I think probably he, the, the results of he, with the Rejuvra is what you're going to notice. It persists in the soil for two or three years, and that's great for providing long-term control of cheatgrass, and in fact, you might even be able to wear out the seed bank because the seeds don't live that long. But it does mean that uh, you can't plant anything in those areas because mm -hmm. that herbicide is non-selective. It, it acts on seeds, and it doesn't really care what species of seeds it, it comes in contact with. So... Um, it's not a herbicide you would want to use in a situation where you need to go in and seed something else after you control the weeds. But you could plant trees or shrubs if you were... If, as long as the roots are going down below the top inch of the soil. You can to... actually uh, spray it around trees, established trees and shrubs, and even perennial plants that have a root system that's you know down that far in the soil versus just that top inch or so where the seed germination is happening. Okay. Jane, could you comment on how the environment affects how long that uh, herbicide persists in the soil if we're looking at two really wet and cold years? Yeah. Uh, is that going to accelerate that or delay that? You know, that's, I'm not aware of the information on Rejuvra. The active ingredient is in Dazaflam. It's, 
you know, it's typically used in, on rangeland in semi-arid environments like mm -hmm. Montana, Wyoming, uh, Idaho. So, um, yeah, that's a good question. I'm not sure. I mean, typically more moisture and, you know, will, might increase microbial activity mm -hmm. to break down a herbicide. Mm -hmm. But I, I don't know. It's a good question, Uda. Okay. Okay. Um, Stephen. A question came in um, from Billings, and they've got bid pigeons invading their patio. Pigeons. <laughs> and okay. yeah, what's a, a lawn? Is there a non lethal way to get rid of them? I know there are also problems for livestock producers. Yeah, too. so exclusion, of course, build them out with netting or spikes or electric shock track is definitely the way. So what the question is are you looking to keep them out of an area or are they on specific ledges? So if they're on ledges, you could use spike products or electric products. You can say, well, I'm not an electrician. You don't need to be. Those, there's solar panels, some of them you just plug in. Bird lands on it, they get shocked, they, they leave the area. Uh, there are also uh, products that are like Avatrol, but that's a restricted use product. It's a frightening device, so they would basically eat some of it. One of them goes into a f uh, distress call, it frightens the flock away. But I think for most homeowners, you want to just simply screen them out, net them out, and there's a variety of products out there. You could go to various websites, uh, you know, birdbarrier.com would be one, there's a whole host of things, Bird X <clears throat> would be another, Bird Be Gone would be another, and these are suppliers that provide all sorts of products, and you'll see the variety, and basically you say which one fits your situation, and they will have technical people there that will help you navigate that, or call me and we can chat about it on the phone. Okay, great, thank you. So, so Uta, I saw in my email stream earlier this week that an ag alert came out on anthracnose of lentil. Can you talk a little bit about that disease on lentils? Yeah, sure. Um also glad to hear you subscribe to the Ag Alert. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Appreciate that. Yeah, so we send out an Ag Alert. Um, the context is that the regional post crop diagnostic lab um, is testing seed lots of post crops. So that's um, a service available to post growers in the region. And so what they found is that um, over the years, the incidence, which means how many seed lots have anthracnose in, in lentil specifically, has been increasing. And so while the infestation in the seed lots themselves is not very high, it just means that this pathogen that causes this disease is in the seed. And so we encourage growers to be vigilant, scouting their fields this year for early symptoms of anthracnose, which um, are usually 10 lesions with a dark margin, and they start at the lower part of the plant um, and then kind of move up. And so this is one of those fungal diseases that is favored by a lot of rain, high moisture, especially around blooming and uh, pot development. And so that's also a time where it gets really tricky to control that disease. That's why scouting early detection is really important so we can apply fungicides if necessary before the canopy closes. And so it's just, you know, an alert to have your eyes out for this disease. If conditions are favorable, we could be looking at a um, you know, a, a yield limiting disease problem. And then also if you're interested in subscribing to the Ag Alerts, um, you can find that at montana.edu slash extension slash IPM slash alerts. And we'll talk about other things than anthracnose too. So whatever is uh, important and relevant for people in the state to know is what we're communicating about. Okay, thank you, Uta. So um, we need to go back to Stephen because there are so many questions that have come in, some really great ones. Um, a caller from North Flathead wants to know if pocket gophers and Columbia ground squirrels are the same animals and they have so many Columbia ground squirrels they can't get rid of them. They've tried juicy fruit gum and it didn't work. <laughs> well, that's strawberry. Not strawberry. Oh, got it. <laughs> strawberry. Okay, well, no, they're not the same species. So pocket gophers and ground squirrels are two different species. You can have them in the same field. So pocket gophers are subterranean primarily. They're what we call fossorial. They live most of their life below ground, create these large kidney-shaped mounds. And of course, the Colombian ground squirrels, they they live below ground as well, but they also come out. You'll see them in their alert posture, and you'll see them running around soon. So uh, you didn't say how many acres you're dealing with, and so you basically have various options. Number one, you want to control ground squirrels early before they have the birth pulse. So the birth pulse is going to occur 
probably mid-May, late May is when they're going to start coming out. Maybe for some of you higher elevations, you might see it a little bit later. Uh, but so you want to control them now. And so you have various options depending on your landscape. We do have rodenticides that are available. Rosol is usually one of them. It's a chlorofacinone based product. You will need to have a license to use that uh, because it's restricted use. Of course, we also have traps. And so I'm, this is my favorite trap here. This is called the GT 2006 <laughs> from Canada. It's a guillotine trap. Oh boy. So basically you put it into the hole and it uh, chokes them out. So this is the trap modified so that you can see it from a distance. And that way you can tell whether the trap's fired or not. Uh, again, these are about $24, $25. You also have this particular trap. This is called an around body grip trap, two and a half inch. Again, if these are traps without bait. You simply place them over the opening, the animal walks through. And then that's it. You want to check your traps at least before nightfall. Otherwise, the coyotes and the foxes will take your trap away because of the free meal that you've given them. So check, make sure they're staked well and uh, you check them regularly. I recommend people checking twice a, twice a day and then just march your way through the field. Otherwise, use rodenticides uh, if you have the right acreage. There are no rodenticides permitted on residential lawns for ground squirrels. There's a lot of confusion out there. People are using stuff. There's nothing. Everything that's for ground squirrels is restricted use for non-residential lawns. What's a residential lawn? The part of your property that you mow regularly is reg residential lawn. The part that you don't, like for those of you that have 20 acres or so, the part that you don't do regularly is non-residential lawn. So make sure you read the label, and if you have questions, definitely reach out to me. And there is a publication that I have on Richardson Ground Squirrel and Columbian Ground Squirrel that'll tell you more than you want to know. Right. And what is that other device on the front? Oh, the good nature, yes. So this is for rats and mice. This is a repeating rodent trap that uses a gas-powered plunger that the animal sticks its head up inside and then this plunger comes across, hits them in the head and then it drops them out. So if you have rats or mice, you can definitely use this trap. It's not, it's not cheap, about $200 but you don't have to keep checking a trap and it'll work for you. And I think I still have gas in it, so we'll see if it works. Nope, I'm out of gas. But the plunger will come across this way, the animal gets hit in the head, then it drops out through gravity and then it resets. So uh, these things cost probably about $10 a piece. Uh, and it's a, it's a great little trap. And the reason why it's 824 is you can get 24 strikes out of one cartridge. Do you mount that on the on a stake or yeah, something? Yeah, so this has a little part here. Uh -huh. This part comes off and you screw it in and then place it up against a tree or on, on a ground. Okay. So if you're doing mice, if you're doing mice, you need to have it three quarters of an inch off the ground. And so you need to make sure you cut a, cut a hole so this will set into the ground. If you're dealing with rats, it's just gonna be a fist, fist high off the ground. The rat sticks its head up inside, bang. And that's can, the end of that. Can you use that in a house? Sure. Just make sure you keep your kids away from it because oh, sure. uh, fingers <laughs> yeah. will be broken. <laughs> so okay. then you have a bunch of unconscious mice and rats laying. Oh no, no, they're not. They're not unconscious. They're, <laughs> well, they're unconscious and then they die. Yeah. Um, so it's uh, actually it passes uh, New Zealand humane laws for mm -hmm. how quickly the animal goes unconscious and dies. So uh, it's just it's an impressive little trap. There's also what's called the A18, and that's for squirrels in larger animals as well. So these are all built out of New Zealand. New Zealand has a huge problem with invasive species and they're trying to do things in a non-toxic way. That's mm -hmm. the big desire. So if you don't want toxicants, this is one device that can be on that, on that route for you. So you don't have to keep checking a trap and emptying it because this will do the job. These are primarily for outdoors because then the scavenger can remove the carcass, but you can use them indoors as well. So is that a CO2 cartridge that you That's have? correct. You steal that from your kid's BB gun? It won't fit. It's just a special size. <laughs> so the, of course. So it has to be a special size <laughs> in order for it to fit. So it's not. It won't. It won't work with your BB gun cartridge. So it's a. It's a uh, specialized size cartridge for that. You know, I'm starting to think you can literally kill 
two rodents with one stone. You set up your traps, you check them regularly, you get your steps in, you even lose weight. Oh, absolutely. Yeah, uh, weight. absolutely. But this would actually reduce your need to check yeah. it because it even has a counter and then you can oh, go out. Wow. So they use these out in, you know, in New Zealand to control various invasives like mm -hmm. rats and uh -huh. weasels. And so that, this way they don't have to go out and check it regularly. Uh, and so it'll last six months. They're, these traps will last, I'm told, up to 10 years. Wow. So they're pretty, it's, I'm very impressed. With Where them. can you got, buy them? Uh, just go to Good Nature or automatictrap.com, automatictrap.com, where you can purchase them. Uh, I think they'll even have them on Amazon and some other locations as well. But, or just look up Good Nature and you'll find some places where you can buy it or contact me and I'll tell you. Right. And it won't damage the fur. You can still skin them out. Skin, <laughs> yeah, not, not, not much of a market for mouse and rat fur. <laughs> <laughs> it would take a lot of them <laughs> to make something. So, um, David, a question for, for, for Vallis. They would like to know the best time of year to prune a maple tree. Mm -hmm. Ah, so this is a good time of year to prune trees before the sap flows. There's an old horticultural <laughs> saying that the best time to prune is when the knife is sharp. But this is actually a really good time because the trees are still dormant. They're just mm -hmm. waking up. Um, so, yeah. Sometimes pruning can um, um, encourage um, breaking of dormancy, so that's why you usually don't want to do it in January or December. But so yeah, great apple trees, maples. That. Now's a good time. And then always a reminder to make sure you clean your Sanitize tools. Sanitize between cuts yes, so you don't mm -hmm. spread any diseases. Thank you. So there's a question about potatoes um, from Hamilton. Um, they bought potatoes at the grocery store that have black spots on the inside and outside. He's wondering if he puts the peels in his compost, mm -hmm. will it cause disease um, in their garden? Um, that's actually, that, that's a great question. And what I'll say in general, um, with anything that you compost, if you're going through a sufficient composting process where you have enough mass where you actually get heating in your mm -hmm. compost pile, um, it should kill any pathogens. Um, David, I know you can comment. I, you need to get up to what? 140 degrees, but you want the whole pile and it's harder to do than it, it It's seems. harder to do, yeah, but you can buy thermometers, but if you keep your if you're in active composting and you're turning it, and right. you're keeping the moisture up, and you're worrying, you know, you're paying attention to nitrogen and carbon sources, you can get it hot enough to kill weed seeds and and any pathogens in there. Mm -hmm. Right. Yeah. And I rarely do. <laughs> Sounds like well, you have to work pretty hard. Just yeah. like you have to work pretty hard pretty to hard. take care you of get the your, You get your upper body yeah. work in to come through steps all the turning. Yeah. But there are out there. There are compost, you know, small scale composters that you can, that it's easier mm -hmm. to turn. But it seems that one of the challenges, at least in a cold climate, is you need about a cubic yard of material right. to generate enough, uh, you know, have enough biomass to generate the heat, mm -hmm. you know. And so when I see these little composters, it's like, geez, I just don't know that right. it's actually going to have enough. That's uh, microbially uh, generated heat? Yes. Mm -hmm. yeah. Okay. Yeah. yeah. And, you know, what we've always done in the past um, we had horses, we don't have any more, but you know, adding manure to the compost pile, adding a nitrogen source, you can actually add nitrogen fertilizer to your yeah. pile, you know, fresh grass clippings, things like Great stuff. that really, really get it cooking, um, definitely help a lot. So, um, so Jean, um, I see you've got a show and tell there that we haven't had a chance to get to. Yeah, yeah, um, so I, I tried to find something green growing in Bozeman and this was the green thing I found. This is uh, bulbous bluegrass, and poa bulbosa, and um, we often get questions on the, sh the show about bulbous bluegrass. It, it's in these little clumps, these circular clumps. Where I found this, it was the only thing green. Um, and if you peel this clump apart, you'll notice that um, the roots of bulbous bluegrass um, have little bulbs at the base, kind of look like a, a little onion, um, and that's where the name comes from, bulbous bluegrass. So I just brought this to um, point out uh, it's greening up. Um, it's in disturbed areas. 
uh, if if you do want to treat it with a herbicide, there, we don't have a lot of options for dealing with this plant other than herbicides, but you could treat this with glyphosate right now mm -hmm. in settings where everything else, it's the only green thing. Mm -hmm. And you could, you could treat it with like six ounces per acre of a glyphosate product, um, and now would be the time to do that. Okay, thank you. I guess I'm wondering what, uh, since it's green, what is the problem for someone's yard? Is it just because it's different grass than what they should have? Well, it's not so much a problem in yards, but it is it is becoming more and more of a problem in range and pasture. Oh, okay. It yeah. often starts on the edges of a pasture okay. where maybe the the vegetation's not quite as competitive, gotcha. but then it starts moving in. It's not um, not palatable. It doesn't. Even, this is about all the. Uh, foliage you get from this plant and then it, it eventually like flower um, but okay. it doesn't provide much forage value for wildlife or okay. um, livestock so in the yard not so much That's of a problem and you could water it and fertilize it out right. with other competitive vegetation uh, okay so um steven a caller from florence is asking about magpies Oh, yeah. They've, it's tough. they've destroyed a couple of nests, but they keep coming back. They're curious if there's anything that can be done to keep them away. Yeah, the challenge with magpies is you're dealing with a protected bird, so it's protected federally, so uh, you have to resist the desire to shoot it. So um, it, that would be a violation of federal law, which gets the, the feds really get wired up about that sort of thing. So you want to avoid that. Yeah, and that would be some. So certainly removing an old nest, although I haven't, I haven't seen them reoccupy older nests. So I'd be interested in that because I certainly see the remnants of old nests around, but I haven't seen them reoccupy. It almost seems like they rebuild. Um, you could always net a tree. You could haze haze the bird. Again, that requires a lot of time. I wish I had an easy answer for you on magpies, and unfortunately, I do not. But hazing could certainly be, uh, so if you start to see them building a nest, hazing could be things like spraying water at them in a way that's not gonna injure the bird. You can't injure the bird, but you can certainly scare it. If you have pyrotechnics, uh, that can do it. Your neighbors might not be happy with you with pyrotechnics, and if you're in urban areas, make sure you contact <clears throat> the police before you begin firing these off. Uh, that could be an issue. They might think there's an, a war going on. Uh, and then last, so, so you might want to think about some sort of uh, flashing devices like a strobe. Um, but otherwise, there's nothing that's going to be very easy on that. Um, and then, of course, if a tree is a problem, you know, removal of the tree, mm -hmm. opening up the canopy may be also helpful as well, up to a third of the branches. Um, but no, nothing's... You can get a depredation permit if it's a real problem, but that costs you $100 just to apply, and there's no guarantee they'll give it to you. Okay, well, we've got a lot more questions for you, so I think we're gonna just let you bring us on home. Okay. So a caller from Helena would like to know if harvesting wild huckle huckleberries results in more human to bear conflict. Oh, that's something I, I don't know, but certainly if you're around food with bears, that would, there's always gonna be that always always going to be that risk so uh, bears are of course they're a game species in montana so that's less in my my wheelhouse than the animals that are unprotected like ground squirrels but certainly if you're around food uh, and bears are out there there's going to be a problem there so you need to make sure you're watching get, keep your bear spray with you and make sure you're with someone that you can run faster than <laughs> okay, one more from Manhattan. How can they keep raccoons out of their sweet corn? Yes, uh, so there would be, you have a couple of things to do there. Uh, electric fencing would probably be the, the best method. So you'd want to have, I don't know what the height is for that. So in terms of electric fencing, I think it's four inches off the ground and then I think 12 inches off the ground. If that's not a possibility, then you're really looking at trapping the population down before they before that corn gets really sweet. And so raccoons are not protected. There's a variety of traps that are available for that, cage traps, of course. Now here's the thing, once you catch them, you're not gonna dump them somewhere else, right? So it's gonna be kind of a one-way trip, if you get what I'm saying, not one-way trip to dump them. They're gonna not come back. 
so a lot of so you need to make sure you have a method but to be able to deal with them in a, in a responsible way and then always remember if you're using cage traps are you going to be prepared to capture uh, catch a skunk a lot of people mm. think that you know they're always like the social contract has somehow been broken because the skunk got into your trap. Skunk is going to walk into your trap, so you need to make sure you're prepared to handle a skunk. Uh, so you always want to make sure you cover your cage trap 50% with a cloth, and that way at least you have a blind spot to come to. You're always wearing gloves when you're handling your cage trap, so that way you can release the skunk if necessary. Uh, and then with your cages, we also have other traps we call encapsulated foot traps, and those are more species specific. It requires the raccoon to stick their foot into it, and then they get caught that way. It's not a foot. It's not. Um, it's not a foothold. So, uh, and then I have a. We have a. We have information on that as well. You can also call. So, me. so many questions so for many Stephen there. Van Tassel yeah. from the Montana Department of Agriculture. <laughs> So thank you so much for joining us today. Thank you, panel. Um, great questions today. Please join us next week for today's cattle operations with Darren Boss, who serves as the department head for MSU Research Center. For more thank you. Resources, visit MontanaPBS.org/AgLive. Montana Ag Live is made possible by the Montana Department of Agriculture, the MSU Extension Service, the MSU Ag Experiment Stations of the College of Agriculture, the Montana Wheat and Barley Committee, Cashman Nursery and Landscaping, the Northern Pulse Growers Association, and the Gallatin Gardeners Club.